Good evening. You know, for over a century, uh, archaeologists have considered the relationships between the U.S. Southwest and by extension Northwest Mexico and Mesoamerica. Most of the people who've written on this have actually been North Americans who've worked in the U.S. Southwest. More muted have been the voices uh, south of the border of Mexican archaeologists, and there are a lot of reasons for this, um, which you can have your own lecture, but uh, today we have a fresh uh, perspective on Mesoamerican Southwest Northwest relationships uh, with today's presenter. Dr. Jose Luis Bunzo Diaz is particularly well situated for uh, this topic because he's worked in a number of different areas in Northwest Mexico. He received his PhD from the Escuela Nacional de Antropología y Historia with research in Durango. He then was director of the museum at Paquimé in Chihuahua, where I first met him. Uh, he then became an investigator in the state of Durango, where he had done his uh, research for his dissertation. And he is currently a investigator, an investigator at the Ina Center in Michoacan, where he has long family relationships. He's interested in uh, material remains particularly, and he also works with North Americans a lot. So he really offers a, an important perspective. He's also, from the South, Southern Arizona perspective, he's on the board of director of the Ameren Foundation. Um, <laughs> Jose Luis just started this very morning, a research field research project at Zinzunzan. And we gotta be really grateful that he drove back home so that he could give this talk uh, to us. So anyway, without further elaboration, uh, Jose Luis, we're looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much, Paul and Fran. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with you uh, this evening and good evening to everybody that it's on Zoom today uh, watching these, uh, these series of lectures. Well, uh, first of all, uh, as Paul says, uh, well, I always uh, consider myself as a North Mexican archaeologist and West North Mexican archaeologist. And we uh, normally uh, are very related to the, you know, to, to the develops that happens in Northern Mexico, like, like, uh, like Paquimé. But uh, it's an important thing that to mention, because as Paul says, there's no so many voices in the Mexican side that address uh, a, a situation that has, well, a lot of time uh, going on on the discussion about the relationship between Mesoamerica and the Southwest. And that's why, because most of the Mexican archaeologists are very focused on the great develops of Mesoamerica in Central Mexico, or in the Mayan area, or Oaxaca, or etc. Well, saying this, I will share my screen. So, well, this evening I want to talk to you about this material perspective that that we have, looking from the south, the relate the Hispanic relationship that has in West Northwest Mexico with the U.S. Southwest uh, connections. So, as Paul says. Uh, this uh, this situation, this uh, this problem was addressed uh, for more than a hundred years. In the early 20th century, it starts to develop these. But there was a big key element that I want to, to talk about, and then it's in 1943, in the framework of the third round table of the Mexican Society of Anthropology. This topic was first discussed by a panel of binational archeologists. And that's, I think it's very important because uh, that was a time when the most important Mexican archeologists like Alfonso Caso, Pedro Armillas, uh, Daniel Rubin de la Morboya, among others uh, on the Mexican side, talk about this with their colleagues like uh, Paul Kirbo, like uh, Isabel Kelly, Emil Jauri, Ralph Beals, Donald Brand, or Alden Mason, uh, that and, and I think that's a very, very important point because that, that meeting uh, makes to start in the next decades a series of projects that were developed in North Central and Northwestern Mexico, such as the Rio Conchos River, in Paquime, Chihuahua, of course, 
uh, in Northwest Durango and the Guadiana Valley, in Alta Vista, in Zacatecas, or in El Tunal Grande in San Luis Potosí, or in many parts of Sonora, where sometimes Mexican archaeologists and American archaeologists works together. You know, like, uh, for instance, the works of Charles Kelly in Durango that works among with Roman Piñachan or the works with Eduardo Contreras and, uh, and Di Peso in Charlie Di Peso in Paquime. So, so I think that that starts at this important thing. And one of the interesting things is this, this kind of relationship between Mexican and American archeologists continue all along the time. And there are very successful projects going on today that makes these binational relationships and these binational perspectives going on. And I'm gonna talk about later about this in my own uh, experience. Well, uh, in that, in terms of the archeological indicators that, that makes important this relationship since that times, it was uh, the, the importance of crops, the particularly maize, of course, in the Southwest, the presence of architectural elements such as bolt courts, mounds with platforms in Hohokam and ancestral Pueblo sites, as well the presence of pirate mirrors, uh, shell trumpets, glycemers bracelets, copper bells, and I will talk about a lot about copper bells and sorry about that, but I love copper. So, <laughs> so part of the, of, of the presentation will be addressed on that. And uh, macaws, cylindrical vases, ceramic remains, pseudo cloisonne decoration, among all of the other things and a lot of iconography and a lot of things we're talking about these. And, but in the other hand, if you're looking from the south, the, the major presence of these southwest relationships is, a, is the blue-green stones. And we'll talk about these blue-green stones uh, later. Uh, of course, these make some kinds of different uh, inter interpretative models uh, that address these problems in these uh, in the in these five decades or more. Uh, and the most important ones were related to the economic of commercial uh, ground of the agricultural displacement, the coercitive domination, and the multifactorial way that that's more of the things that we, we think today. And now we are analyzing more of these or a lot of these using uh, computing analysis and network analysis. At the very end, I will present what are we doing with these kind of approaches uh, these days. And well, of course, here are a lot of authors and I will mention a few like uh, Randall Maguire, Nelson, Fish and Fish, Villalpando, of course, Minis and Wayland, uh, Gamboa, Gallaga, Martinez, Carpenter, Cruz, Maxwell, Crown, Matthew, Witz, Melgar, Robles, Schwartz, and many, many among others that are talking about this problem in the recent times. And it's an open uh, debate uh, for the moment. But with this uh, framework, uh, I will start talking about my own uh, research on the topic and how we address in different projects with colleagues in both sides of the border. So first of all, I want to talk about one of my projects. It calls the Pipamon, Pipanon Project. It's Proyecto de la Investigación de Poblaciones Antiguas en el Norte y Occidente de México. And this is a project, very interesting project that we are working with 35 colleagues in Mexico that uh, works in places in all West and Northwest Mexico that, uh, that make excavations and have human remains uh, during their excavations. And with a, pro with a project with the University of Harvard, with uh, David Reich's laboratory in the University of, of Harvard, we are making a huge uh, DNA analysis for the structure of the population in West and Northwest Mexico in different spans of time. So uh, I will present very draft data. So uh, please uh, don't think that this is a final chart or anything like else. So it's, 
It's how we are looking the data today. And this will change a lot in the near future uh, in, the, in, in the works that we are doing. So, but the very important thing here, it's like, you can see we have, of course we have a holes in our sampling because of the pandemic now that stops the project and, and the sampling and traveling and everything that we know in these two years. Uh, but uh, the important thing is that we have a huge, uh, a huge uh, panorama of the uh, of these different populations, and the most important thing is that we see a clear pattern related to a geographical structure of the of the population. So this is very important for us because. If we see in the in the different clusters that we are looking on the whole genome G, uh, DNA that we are working with, uh, so we can see that how these uh, these populations plot very separately in the in the charts that we are looking for. So they are like very southern populations that are not, that are not stronger related to the very northern population. So this idea that we have like the like the big migrations or things like that, at least in terms of the Asian DNA or what we are looking now, it doesn't look like happened that way. So of course there are sites, very important portion of sites in the in the center that have both uh, relations that as we can see, in the area that is so important because that that area that was worked and addressed in the 1943 in this uh, important meeting, uh, it's the same places where a lot of the projects went. So, so of course, this northern frontier of Mesoamerica, uh, it's so important to understand the relationship between northern Mexico. U.S. Southwest and Mesoamerica, and this chunk, it's it's so important to make more detailed studies on that. And with that in mind, also we can see that there are not like an homogeneous uh, populations that we are see. We have these uh, individuals that go outside the charts. So with that in mind, we have to think even in the mitochondrial DNA also. Uh, as we can see, the structure of the, of the female population um, on the mitochondrial DNA also it's different in the in the different areas of here. So so th there there not look like these big uh, migrations or integrations of the populations on, on this. So this I think it's a very important starting point to think about how these relations could happen with actual people walking on the on these on these uh, terrain on these mm, little bit more than a thousand uh miles that goes from one edge to the other in this area so the second uh approach that i want to to present it today it's another project that uh, it's called Connections and Impacts of Northern West Mexican Cultures Project. And this project is realized in conjunction between INA, my institution in Mexico, and it's coordinated by Dr. Ben Nelson of the Arizona State University and colleagues uh, from students from both sides of the border. We have every week reunions uh, talking about this topic and, and reviewing all these sites. Now we have in this sample almost uh, 500 sites analyzed, more than 5,400 uh, set of objects and more than 30,000 uh, individual objects analyzed in our database. Uh, and this is very important because we have a real big sample of material culture that, that let me go to the next uh, slide, like the, the things that we call interaction markers. Uh, 
with Dr. Ben Nelson, we have uh, discussing this a lot and, and his group and, and he uh, list at the beginning of the project, all of these uh, that we call interaction markers that are blue green stones, conch shells, copper, mirrors, pallets, uh, possible cacao vessels, pseudo croissant ceramics, shell bracelets, and tropical birds. Of course, there are more, uh, but uh, we think in the project that we will concentrate it only on these. If I do a presentation of all of these, of course, we will stay here for a lot of hours, so and we don't have that time. So I will make a quick tour of the most important ones with the meaningful relationships, and I will take a little bit more time discussing about the metal work and the copper, uh, that it's one of the most important, in my perspective, interaction markers that makes to see these connections more from the south to the north uh, uh, in a very unique and important way because of this technology. So with this, we, we can see the distribution of these. And also, uh, this uh, map shows up, show us uh, uh, the abundance of these connection markers in the areas. And please, uh, I want to, to make your, keep your attention on, on the big circles that, you, that we can see in these areas, because that big circles will be centers of these interactions, of this interaction network, because it's not that those will be like the most important ones, but as we're gonna be at the end of the presentation, I hope to 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 to, to go to the, to that place. Like there are these big elements, but also these big elements are connected in an in a very intricate net uh, of relationships between small sites all along the way to make this connection happens and make these big area. As a, un, as, as a one area with, uh, with, no, with no separation. So at the very end, I, one of the things I, I want to say today, it's like looking from South and looking from Northern Mexico and the Northern frontier of Mesoamerica, North Mexico and the United States and the United States Southwest is the same region. So it's a very integrated, uh, place that has to be studied as a whole, in my perspective. So, okay, but let's start with the first uh, with the first examples of of this kind of relationships. The first of all, I want to show you uh, the pseudo cloisonne vessels. Uh, for the ones who are not familiar with this um, with this kind of decoration in different su supports because it could be done as we can see here in Pakime or in Arizona that the, like the ones we are seeing uh, we can see that it, they use shells for instance to make this kind of a stucco and they color it and make the designs with it so and in northern Mexico like it, the cup that is here, that it's found in uh, in Alta Vista in Zacatecas, or these ones are beautiful, these very codex and complex vessels found in West Mexico in the state of Michoacan, where I live now. But uh, we can see these as an important thing. So if we see in this uh, in this map, we GIS uh, uh, all these all these different elements. And we can see that it's a path that goes all the way north. But one of the important things here, and that's only we address uh, these questions and probably more clever students in the future uh, with clever minds like, my, like the one that I have uh, will address this in a better way. Uh, there's a clear differences between these. So, uh, we talk about like the one thing in in the in pseudo cloisonne or even in all the relationships, but the re but the reality is things are different in different places sometimes. So it looks like 
there are these also these kind of transmissions of technologies that moves in different ways in this network, not only the objects, you know, the, all the ideas that are behind these objects. So as we can see, we see these kind of big vessels in the south, but in the north, we have like a different kind of using of these. Also in Northern Mexico, the use of cords for having this kind of decoration, it's very common. Uh, also, uh, you can see here, probably one of the glycemeries or different uh, shell bracelets. It's another, it's another way to look at. And we can see that it's a huge concentration as we know in Arizona, uh, in the Hohokam sites, but there's a amount of those and, and they're not so common in other places in Mesoamerica as we think. Uh, when we start to plotting uh, the numbers of, the, of these uh, glycemeries uh, bracelets, it's a strongly a uh, correlation between more in the north and less in the south, but it doesn't say that it doesn't exist or in the south exists a different way of uh, using this bracelet like the one we are, sh we are showing. So, so that's another element that we need to think with more careful uh, to see what's going on. Uh, of course, one of the biggest and the most important elements that that were addressed for these relationships between uh, the Southwest and Mesoamerica and the or the West Mexico is the blue green stones. Uh, uh, as we know, there's a bunch of different elements in all the ancestral pueblo sites with these beads or the mosaics in the Hohokam area, uh, but also. If we are going south, we can see a lot of different elements. Uh, we can see a lot of uh, different, uh, different uh, ways that they use these uh, these these things, uh, these uh, these blue green stones. Uh, for for instance, in central Mexico, we can see the use in Tula, uh, the kind of these big discs with a lot of different blue green stones or these ones uh, in Templo Mayor in Mexico City or the famous serpent that, that is uh, <coughs> the museums. And of course, the use of air plugs like the like this one that we are finding in Michoacan as where Paul, Paul says that we are doing excavations now. Uh, in Michoacan, this is one of the of the air, the air plugs that we found out in one of the tombs, and we do uh, some analysis of of these uh, to see that not all the blue things is turquoise. And I will uh, excuse myself, and I will move a little bit these in a different way. Sorry, here because I don't know what happens, but I just look that this uh, this uh, slide was has to be earlier because one of the important things here in Mexico that we see is that not all blue uh, blue blue green stones it's turquoise not all blue it's turquoise we have a lot of amazonite and another minerals that are used in central Mexico and in North Mexico as well as uh, as turquoise so we have in these beautiful masks and discs and things like we show in the last slide uh, with uh, real turquoise uh, and north southwest mexico no sorry uh, northwest mexico or american southwest origin and there is groups that are working a lot of the, on these but also there are a few uh, other elements and other blue green stones are in the same in the same objects that have a totally different origin, like the Masonite, as I as I said, or uh, or a very important work made by Dave Killick and Tali and Alison Tibedu that was uh, presented a couple of years ago about the probably different origin of a lot of uh, of turquoise and other sources that are in central Mexico. And, and that opens a whole new panorama of, 
of the blue green uh, relationship between North Mexico, sorry, because between Mesoamerica and the American Southwest. So, so that will, will be a very important topic that we will uh, address in the future. So, and sorry again, I will go back, spoiling a little bit. <laughs> and well, uh, the other uh, interaction mark that it's so important in the American Southwest and we will uh, just uh, make uh, a chapter in a book with Dr. Ben Nelson and, and Chris Schwartz. It's about the, uh, the presence of tropical birds in Northern Mexico. And of course, Pakime, where I uh, first met Paul a lot of years ago, uh it's one of the major topics and most important things uh that make these connections or the most obvious here i want to address this map that i did uh on the maximum occupation areas of macos of historical maximum occupations of macos in mexico of course this is not happening anymore uh but as we see, we have the Ara Militaris, that it's the, the green military Macaw, that makes and weighs a lot into the Northern Mexico and even close to the, to the border between the United States. And also there's the Rhinox Copita, that it's, you know, it's the thick bullet parrot that have all this distribution along the Sierra Madre Occidental and very nearby Pakime that there's a couple of these uh, elements. But the other side, it's the most interesting one because as we know, the maximum range of expansion of the uh, Ara Militar, so, sorry, of the Ara Macau, so the, the red uh, Macau, it's in the region that we call Huasteca. And this region of the Huasteca, uh, they're you know far away from Pakime and all the southwest area. And there's a lot of different ways to approach that if people walk this way or there's a relationship between between these areas and then all these parrots or these macaws that came into the north. So, but the important thing that that I want to to address, it's like in, in Pakime, uh, and there's a discussion of how many of these macaws are really being in Pakime, but well, I will go with the Macusek uh, numbers that it's 510 individuals that was found over there. And there are the numbers, I don't want to read it, but the most important thing in Pakime is our elements of, they are breeding it, as you know, and those are, a lot of uh, burial remains of these macaws. And even into the Southwest, there are burials of the macaws by itself. Uh, there's also a very interesting uh, research about all the um, different G uh, DNA of these macaws that uh, it's so important. But I want to, do, to keep in mind that in the North, there are these kind of burial of macaws that we found out. And if you go south, even you have like in the northern frontier of Mesoamerica or in the in the different uh, in different historical sources that you have uh, the and you know the the breeding of macaws or parrots, like the ones that we saw here, I have a beak here. Uh, that I found out in a cliff dwelling in Durango, Mexico, that we know that there are, because the Spaniards uh, uh, said that the, these people are breeding uh, parrots or this possible macopen from another site in Northern Mexico or the representations in the rock art or in the ceramics of the macos. It's completely different, the use of that. As, as I said, in in Pakime or in the Northern Mexico, there are these kind of, uh, of burials between birds and even humans, as we are displaying in the Dipeso books. But if we go to Mexico, to Central Mexico, 
there are probably no, and I want to see in the next slide, there are almost known uh, burials of macaws. And, the, and all the feathers of macaws and the different birds are the most important part of the tributes that we saw in the uh, in the codex that we have from Mex from Central Mexico or even from the area of Oaxaca. So, so it looks like like it's a totally different relationship in Mesoamerica. That the most important thing is the feathers, and the birds by itself probably were not treated as the way it was treated in the. United States Southwest or Northern Mexico. And, and here's uh, uh, a map that I GIS with uh, burials of macaws in, uh, in the US Southwest and in Mesoamerica. And you can see there are only one in Oaxaca, a couple in Guatemala, and in Central Mexico, there are no single one. The, it's shocking. For instance, like a uh, place like Templo Mayor that have so many uh, animals in their in their different uh, in their uh, offerings, there are no one macaw bone in in those found in Teotihuacan in in Templo Mayor. So, with that, let me go uh, to the metal work. I will make it uh, very quick because the the clock is ticking. And let me do this. Okay, the I want to 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 go about uh, talk about the uh, the copper because copper it's a very important uh, material that has a very complex technology that was developed in South America, and we can see some examples here. Putuxio in Ecuador, for instance, it's one of the most uh, uh, old places with more than thirty thousand years ago. And there are people smelting gold over there or different places like in the Bolivian Altiplano or, or other places in Peru or Colombia. Uh, but the important thing is like, I think it's very well demonstrated by a lot of different uh, authors. And I have to, to say that Dorothy Hosler, of course, is one of the major uh, most authorized voices on these. But now we think that the, uh, the technologies uh, of cold hammering and lost wax technologies came into West Mexico as a technological package that arrives uh, into the coast. Some now I think sometime between 800 or 900 uh, before Christ. Uh, and I think it's very, very important because uh, we thought first that it could came earlier in the 600s or earlier than that in a lot of time. But, but now with all the works that we know, uh, we, we think that the copper explosion and appearance in all this time, it's around these 900. So it's a very short span of time that uh, before the Spaniards arrived, that these important element conquer, if we can see that way, all the areas of West Mexico and North and North and West Mexico, and it came into the into the United States Southwest. Okay, okay, so let's do it very quickly. Of course, for having uh, uh, copper, you need copper mines. And we can see here that uh, there are big copper mines in West Mexico. Of course, there are copper mines in Chihuahua, in Sonora, of course, and into Arizona. Uh, there's a lot of copper mines, but uh, I work in the ones here in the Tierra Caliente in Michoacan. And well, we found out some excavation, uh, little tunnels, etc. So I will go this make first. And one of the important things is to bring from ore to the metal, to the ingot, and then the ingot into an object, it's a very complex thing. And it's totally different thing going from the ore to the ingot. And there's a kind of a 
society that makes that, you know, and we call it that uh, primary smelting. And then when you have the ingot, you can do the fine jewelry. So, and that's the second part of these. And there are not the same people that do these uh, very complex things or very beautiful jewelry or the guys to take it from the mountain and transform it into ingot. So with that, we, we make some uh, archeological uh, testings uh, and we work with different uh, handcrafts to metal smiths in my hometown in Michoacan in Santa Clara del Cobre. And here are making this. When I was a kid, I, I, I used to see these uh, all my vacation time. I never imagined that I will make this um, research topic <laughs> years later. Uh, so, but but here we can see all, all, all the parts that became to have an ingot from, uh, from this smelting. Uh, on the other hand, of course, this produced a lot of slag that we analyze and work with this slag. And we have these little ingots as that's, that's once we found out and these are uh, these sites. And there are not so many places when you have these production areas, finding crucibles or finding uh, slags or different ways uh, uh, to see these. I have these kind of sites in West Mexico, but I don't want to stop this. And once in the area of Nayarit, and always we have the thing or the problem of what happens in Pakime. And I will want to make that at the very end. Of course, when you have these little ingots, you don't have to, uh, or it's not the same, you have to transport these ingots into the, into the jewelry uh, workshops. Uh, and of course, these are, and we make some experiments and everything here with, uh, with these mecapaleros that, uh, that still been moving things in Mexico and in West Mexico, even the uh, half of the 20th century, even in the 1980s. Uh, part of my family remember these, uh, these people that are bringing things and selling along the way, along the Caminos Reales in, in Mexico, even in the 70s. Uh, so, so it was very possible that, that you could move a lot of these also, there are two main techniques. Here you can see the cold hammering. They are cutting an ingot here to make some, uh, some castles, some big pots. Uh, but also we found out molds in the, uh, in the warehouses of the, of the museums in Mexico. Molds exactly the same as the ones I saw and I was uh, working with in Colombia and Ecuador, these open molds to to uh, smelt, as we saw in the Florentino Codex, uh, these axes or these series of elements. So let's move it. Uh, so as, as I said, well, there's a lot of people that works this. Uh, of course, Pendergast was one of the major important things, Dorothy Hosler, and then among others, uh, and well, all the data that I present, it's about 5,400 metal objects in more than 132 sites that I analyzed in the last years. So if we do GIS with that, one of the important things here that I want to make uh, clear, it's in this area in, in West Mexico, there are a great variety of elements that we can see here. Uh, we have belts weld into rings or these pendants or tweezers or sheets or lip plugs, belts with different, uh, with different things, rings of gold, silver, and, uh, and a lot of different aleaciones. Uh, uh, Sorry, I, I forgot the, the word in English. Uh, but if you go north, these uh, variety, uh, it's more scarce, but there are elements like these air plugs 
that are not present in the main areas. So, or in the central West Mexico area. So that makes to make suspicion of what's happening with elements. And in Durango, where I was working, we have a lot of elements that are not present in the collections in other sites, more in the West Mexico, or in Paquimé, that it's a very, very diverse elements and very unique elements, as we're gonna see, uh, of metal work. But into the Southwest, there are most bells and tinkers. And the tinkers is an element that it's not very common in, in the South. And it's very important because these tinkers are common in, in, in the archeology span of the Southwest in, in the metals. I have the opportunity to work in the Arizona State Museum uh, doing research of the collections and the Amarin Foundation. And, and it's very interesting because the elements have very different, it's, there are a lot of similarities, but there are a few things that makes us uh, to take a, a better look. Uh, so of course there are elements like these, uh, like these uh, bells, these Tlaloc complex bells that are very, very common in West Mexico. And then we found out in Paquime, we found out in Trincheras in Sonora, but we also found out in Wupatki in Arizona. So this is one of the elements that of course makes us to see this network, how does it work? Or these uh, elements that we found out like the, the famous turtle bell in Paquime, and then these turtle bells that we found out in different places of the of the south of the West Mexico, or these in Durango, as I mentioned, that have these different kind of uh, elements of copper that we uh, that we analyze. So let's talk about a little bit about Pakime. The little bit about Pakime, they are very there are elements that are repeated all the way, but there are elements that are not repeated. Repeated. Elements that are very, very, very unique in Pakime, like these two mold smelt uh, axe, that it's unique. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So that makes me think that maybe, maybe these guys are are doing some objects over around here, or this vessel with turquoise tesars or these ingots or these sprues that are found out in Pakime. So definitely I, I need to, to work on this. And as I told you, look at the elements that are present in the most of the Arizona sites, uh, like these ones are showing that are, they're repeated in different places, but they are definitely very simple if you compare with the things that are happening south, starting in Pakime, but of course more in West Mexico. Uh, well, I go back, back to this, but this only with the coppers, you can see the dots. You can see the dots that are uh, most important displays, but you can see these lot of different sites that are all the way around. And all of these different sites, if we do, uh, an analysis of a network analysis of this, you can see it like this. You can see the big polities like Pakime, but you but you can see there are connections everywhere that make clusters of different sites that are more related to uh, to them by itself. Here are how we 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 plot these. With uh, with other with other part of the team that makes this computer science, but you can see in 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 the north how these are making complex things, and all the elements are in these complex uh in these complex networks are tied together. So we cannot understand these complex relationships between Mesoamerica and the United States Southwest, only looking to the big sites. It's one of the things that I want to, to say. We, can, we need to understand these big sites, but in relation with a lot of different small sites and sites that are participating in, the, in one network, but not participating in another network that you could find or not these kind of elements 
but all this web that it's uh, moving or moving over there probably will make more sense with the with the genetic data that we have that we have to look on this in a different with a different eyes and looking from all the places. Well, I want to to finish uh, my presentation uh, only addressing uh, to that there is one single region on this, so we cannot understand this divided by the border. The today, border is an accident that have 150 years. Uh, so, so we need to continue these interactions between academics, both sides of the border. And, and one of the important things is uh, like these uh, different sites, as I mentioned, not all participates in the network, but this network, it's very complex. And this network uh, have to be analyzed in, in a way that probably today only computers could help us to understand. And with that, I will stop here not to, uh, to abuse on, on the time that I have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jose Luis, um, for that perspective from the South. We, we need it, so thank you. Um, I do have a, some questions starting already, so let's just get started. Um, is there any evidence that copper was mined in Southern Arizona or New Mexico? Well, that's a very tough question. Uh, in pre-Hispanic times that I know, there is no uh, evidence of mining copper in pre-Hispanic times. But uh, when I was uh, visiting some members sites on, on Matok ruin, uh, for instance, there are a lot of native ingots like uh that there are or uh how to say that it's pebbles sorry i i i forgot the word in english that are displayed in the museum that they are found out in the surface so having native copper it's not a difficult i think way to address these metals in in southern arizona but I think I'm not the specialist to uh, to talk about that. All right. Um, how about were any of the blue green discs malachite, azurite, or chrysocolla? Yes, 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 yes. Those those have uh, these kind of minerals too. These kind of uh, of rocks. Uh, uh, and, 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 and that's one of the important things that I want to, to say on, the, on, on that slide that was out of place <laughs> that I see. It's like, uh, we need to be very careful uh, as an archeologist because it was a lot of time that if you see a blue stone, you said it's turquoise and you always connected directly to the Southwest and and of course, there are a lot of chemical pure turquoise coming from the Southwest, but we need to do so many analyses to do that. So we need to do Raman spectroscopy. We need to do uh, EDS uh, with, uh, with microscope uh, technologies or LAPS technology or different technologies that makes us to understand exactly what what is the composition of the different minerals that are, we are looking for? And one of the interesting things, and I'm not sure how much happens into the Southwest because I never analyze uh, materials from the Southwest, but, but the analyze that I, but the things that I analyze from West Mexico or my Mexican colleagues do from Central Mexico or even the Oaxaca area, it's like there are so many blue mineral and stones that are used in the same mask, for instance. So there are, there are turquoise com coming from the Southwest, but also are turquoise that have like a different print 
as David Kellex no, make notice on that. And it's an amazing thing. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about that. And or you have a masonite that it looks like the same, but it's but it has like a total mineral and geological origin that doesn't have to, it's a total different thing. Or you have malachite, or you have chrysocolla, or you have azurite. So, so it's a very complex thing uh, at the very end. And, and there's a lot of people working on this. Thank you. Um, how about, um, what do you think of the flower worlds idea in relation <laughs> to some of the West Mexico sites you identified in your research? Well, uh, Mike Matthewitz, uh address great about the the flower world connections on 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 this. I I don't uh, put it on this presentation because uh, I was trying to present more the the materials itself more than the iconography because well the iconography I think it's a little bit more tricky. Uh, in certain ways, but definitely are very, very important elements about this flower world that happens in the in in West Mexico and most in one of the major uh, develops in West Mexico. That it's a key element on this uh, discussion about the connections between um, Mesoamerica and and the Southwest. That it's the uh, the Aztatlan tradition. The Aztatlan tradition that comes all the way in the West Coast from Michoacan to all the way up, have these flower uh, compound, uh, very, this complex, very, very well developed. And, and I think it's one of the key uh, elements that we need to, to address to see how these, for instance, the copper moves up north. So definitely it's a very, very important and great question. Thank you. Don't see any more questions right now. I'll give it a minute here. Wait, here's another one. Um, is there any DNA evidence from the US Southwest that's similar or not to the AD, I'm sorry, the ADNA evidence, um, similar or not to the ADNA from Northern Mexico. So is there any ADNA evidence from the Southwest that's similar or not? Well, here I will uh, start saying that the, um, the way that we do archaeology in Mexico and the way that archaeology developed in the States have like a very different traditions and a very different perspectives. Uh, and that makes us in, in Mexico have more opportunity to make this kind of analysis of Asian DNA in Asian populations uh, uh, as the ones I presented. But as you see, the border uh, even that I said that the border is not important in this project, it's important in politics and the way of the develop of science uh, happens. And in the Southwest, it's so, it's so much difficult to uh, to understand. Uh, well, so sorry to to address to Asian DNA. So I'm very anxious to see results on Mimbres, for instance, Mimbres DNA or other places DNA. So for the moment, we don't have so much uh, elements, but the ones that are published, I didn't put it in these, uh, in these slides, but the ones that are published and available from the Southwest, it looks like so much to Northern Mexico populations. So, so that will be like the short answer. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, so I have a question for you in the chat, if you don't mind um, reading ah, in yourself. Spanish. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> thank well, you. <laughs> let, I, I will I will address in Spanish. <laughs> question, and I will say it in Spanish and make that translation later. Well, Tita Branif, one of my dearest and most admired teachers that I have, and probably one of the motors that I've been a Northern Mexican archaeologist found, uh, dice, encontró un entierro de guacamayo en el sitio de Ojo de Agua cerca de Frontera Sonora. Yes. Eh, Tita, 
Tita uh, Braniv was one of the most important women in science, in archaeology in Mexico. And yes, she found out a lot of elements. But as I mentioned, all of these northern sites have these elements more related to the burials. But uh, the ones that are more in central and, and in South Mexico, they are not. They are more, probably they have it more over there or they are breeding it in their houses. And I, I, I don't know what happens, but the relation is completely different. Even with the uh, indigenous populations today, uh, for instance, in the Great Nayara area, like uh, Huicholes, the Huirraricas, or Coras, or uh, Tepehuanes, that they also use these parrot uh, feathers, and the feathers are the most important thing because it be because there are flames, there are you know, the sun, different elements that 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 they use it today. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go back to the DNA. Um, given how different practices in DNA between the US Southwest and Northwest Mexico are, so given that the practices are different, how are you able to communicate and work effectively with descendant communities on both sides of the border? Well, that's a great, uh, great question. Uh, actually, I I recommend I, maybe if you are interested in, in this topic, uh, I just published with a large group of, of a great team that was put together with people from all, from all around the world with different perspectives, uh, people from the United States, but not only from the United States, because one of the things that happens a lot in these, it's like uh, there are like only some visions of, of what's going on. And this paper you could found out in was published in Nature. You could ask, you could look on this. It's a recent one of the end of the last year, or in my uh, page in academia.edu, you could take a look on the on that, and you could make more. But of course, it's a different relationship with the communities in Mexico that it's in the states. First. There's a lot of communities in Mexico that doesn't feel a strong bounds with uh, with certain remains that are not in their own cultural sphere in time or in in territory. Uh, so that's a very important issue. Because of course we we talk we have a lot of talking and we and and we work together with the different uh, communities but sometimes it's not that simple uh, to make uh, direct connections for them for the indigenous communities or for the archaeologists or for the uh, governments with ancient remains and the today uh, today communities. Uh, I think that happens totally different in different parts of the world. And you can take a look on, on that article because you can see that ha that happens a lot in the United States or in Canada or in Australia. But the relations with that in Africa or in Asia or in Latin America, it's absolutely different. So this kind of, uh, of of ways to do things and to talk with the descendant communities and, and work these ethics on nation DNA, one, one size doesn't fit for all. So every place and every case is different. So you have to take it that way. And of course, we are very careful uh, to do it that way and make all the regulations also in the in the countries that are uh, mandatory for doing this kind of analysis that it's very sensitive, of course. Thank you very much for that. Um, there is one other about the DNA. Since ADNE is female, couldn't men have migrated, traded to the north without affecting local um, mitochondrial DNA? 
Well, yes, uh, yes, but uh, but the first uh, part uh, of this of the probably I don't be uh, quite uh, make emphasis on that, but we are analyzing the whole genome uh, on the project, so uh, we are looking for the female and male uh, part of the DNA. And the first three slides that, that I present about that, all of those are both male and female uh, whole genome analysis. So that makes or looks like the migration of men uh, into these populations and women, of course. But at the very end, of course, also we work with the mitochondrial DNA and that's why we can see the women uh, part of this history alone, because of course uh, the mitochondrial DNA going on the matrilineal side. So, uh, so even in those places, it doesn't look like there are like big, big migrations. Probably it's one of my shocking moments when we are working on this and everybody and all we said these big migrations and everything and well it doesn't look like on, on science <laughs> <laughs> um okay um another one this is about uh the minerals again i'm familiar with the amazonite from tingam Tingambato, Tingambato, okay. and the Great. possible sourcing of these this material to Pikes Peak in Colorado in the U.S. Do you know if the lab that analyzed these samples considered possible sources of amazonite in Chihuahua or Oaxaca? Great question. Uh, well, Tingambato is one of the sites that I work more. It's one of the sites that I make excavations for the last ten years. And I make the analysis of all of that uh, blue green stones with a colleague here in Michoacán, el Dr. Jacinto Robles Camacho. He's a huge expert on the topic. Uh, he's one of the people that really know more about the about these blue green stones. And and he uh, told me in the analysis that we made that unfortunately with the Amazonite, we don't have or don't we been able to address the exact source of, of, those, of those materials. Uh, as I said, the Amazonite, it's a totally different uh, mineral. It doesn't have to be nothing with, uh, with the copper like the turquoise, turquoise is related to the copper deposits and this is not, this is a totally different thing. And there are like these two big uh, places, but there are more, Nevada also have, and California have, uh, these Twin Peaks in Colorado have Amazonite, but in Mexico, they're in Southern Chihuahua, they are a big uh, Amazonite uh, deposit, but, in the research that uh, Dr. Jacinto Robles made, he been done been able to 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 make a direct link uh, uh, on that. And it's well, I hope we can do it in the future. And there also, as I, as they mentioned, that there's a possible source in Oaxaca, but this is like a kind of a ghost source because nobody see it. It's mentioned in some books, but. But there are not actual minerals coming from there that we can test in the lab. So, okay. Uh, all right. This is about macaws. Um, Phil Weigand once told me that there was an isolated population of scarlet macaws in Michoacan. Is is or was there such a population? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. I I, I work in the in the area in Michoacan in the Tierra Caliente area where where the macaws uh, live. I, I, I work with colleagues that, that are doing ecological restoration for the habitats of the macaws in Michoacan. And there are uh, some sanctuaries of macaws here in the Tierra Caliente in very isolated and very difficult places uh, to get in, like El Chocolate in Michoacan. 
And, and no, there are green military macaws. There are no uh, populations of scarlet macaws in Michoacan uh, or, or was uh, this important thing here. It's like in historical sources in the Sinsunsan, that it's the capital of the Tarascan uh, Empire. We know that they bred uh, macaws and they bred it for their uh, red feathers. So could being uh, scarlet macaws that are bringing from the Huasteca area and breed it in West Mexico and then could be transported. But in the wilderness, there wasn't uh, populations of scarlet macaws in West Mexico. Okay. Um, were there ceramics or obsidian being traded from Mesoamerica to the American Southwest? Well, I think both. Uh, also, I didn't I didn't put uh, some uh, some elements, but I was uh, when I was director in in Pakime, uh, Well, I was analyzing, of course, the the shirts that the peso found from West Mexico, and I make a relook of the Durango part of it. And once I looked like very different, so I don't even recognize this as a, as a, that came from Durango, but all other uh, like the spindle worlds or different ceramics are absolutely look like the ones in West Mexico. So it's probably in these networks also are moving vessels for sure, for sure. And also obsidian. Uh, I don't know, I never made uh, analysis or I didn't know even into deep into the Southwest, but at least in Northern Mexico, definitely we found out uh, few, but they are some uh, obsidian that came from Central Mexico in places like in Northern Durango, for instance. So, so of course, all these uh, networks are moving a lot of different goods, not, not only these uh, interaction markers, of course, that we are, we are looking for. But as, as I mentioned, uh, when we work or, or, or when we analyze or make some ethnographic uh, interviews with the people that saw uh, these mecapaleros, these tomb line, uh, guys that are walking since very recent times, they bring so much and different things uh, from, from the areas, uh, from different areas to another areas, and they buy new things in, in this area and bring it back to their home. So they are, they are moving a lot of things. It's not like a specialized thing. Probably they are moving uh, these kind of people, or as a as a as a as a way, uh, different elements, of course, in the, in the, in the same in the same trips that they made. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have one final question. Uh, what other connections are there between ancient Ecuador and other Western areas of South America and Western Mexico? I heard a lecture about cacao being introduced to to the west coast of ancient Mexico from Ecuador and maize going from Mexico to Ecuador in very early times. Well, yes. Uh, well, it's one of the other my passion teams <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that, that it's this relationship with South America. Uh, the coast of Ecuador is the most likely part where these connections happen. But it's, we, we have to understand that it's not like a, only Ecuador area, but it's all that coast of North South America that has parts in Colombia, all the way Ecuador, probably some parts in even in, in Peru that, that have like a lot of elements. We have elements that goes from shaft tombs, for instance, the great shaft tombs that we have in, in West Mexico, there are a correlation with the shaft tombs or hipogeos, as the Colombian colleagues call it in Tierra, in Tierra Adentro, or 
the ways that are used the earth architecture in, in West Mexico are in, in different parts of Mesoamerica as the ones we saw in, in, in Peru, or of course, all the metal work and the different traditions that we have. And all these element probably goes in a different places, even in Central America. So, so there are so many uh, elements that we, that we can think about these kind of relationships. Now, of course, the, also these, uh, these elements like uh, cacao that, uh, that was uh, domesticated first in Ecuador or, or this movement could be a very important thing. And as was uh, demonstrated by, by Hustler and I don't remember Howard, Howard I think, it's uh, like it's a kind of a simple way to move from uh, from Ecuador in a big raft, going with the current all the way up into the West Mexico, and then go back six months later uh, when the current change. Uh, so, so definitely there's a relationship in that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jose Luis. Um, we're honored that you took the time to do this for us from from all the way down south. <laughs> and um, uh, th for those of you out there, you'll receive a, a follow up email about the lecture. And there is an uh, email address in there if you have other questions or other comments that you would like to share with Jose Luis or any of us. Um, and I hope you all have a good evening. And again, thank you so much. And thank you so being much, here, everyone else. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, thank you. Everyone have a good night.